Well, I know that some of my colleagues would would look at me and go, what in the world are you doing working in citrus? And uh, I have a pretty simple answer for them. This is the, it's the citrus nursery industry. So you are a small segment of the overall nursery industry. So if we put all the segments of the nursery industry together, it is a huge, and the value of the, of the nursery industry is so huge that it is larger in California in, in agriculture than all other segments of agriculture except dairy. And that says a lot. So you're just a small segment of it. And I, again, if you can all work together and get all the segments together, you guys are very, actually very powerful. So I don't mind working for the citrus nursery industry as it was part of my job. So yes, I, I do know flowers and things like that a lot better. Uh, and I, what I want to do today with my presentation is to just introduce you to some problems that will occur or may occur when you start growing things indoors. It's a lot different than the outdoor, growing your outdoor, uh, your plants outdoors. Things change significantly. The plants change, the pests change, the soil, the environment changes significantly. And it, most of you are probably already aware, but when you take something from indoors after you've grown it for a while, lushly and beautifully, and set it outdoors, it's gonna go through another dramatic change and it's gonna go through some painful um, at re you know, recovery from being indoors all the time. So the sun may burn the leaves and things like that. So we just wanted to try to make you aware of some of those things that are gonna go on uh, when you're starting to grow some of these nursery plants or these plants from outdoors and start to move them indoors. And I, I thought what I would do in my presentation is to give you just some of the simple basics. You're probably already familiar with a lot of this already, but I'm hoping to just prepare you for, again, the things that you're going to need to do in, inside that you're probably not doing outdoors. So traditionally in the, in the, in the ornamental industry, and maybe in yours as well, it, it has been a scheduled pesticide application. So you want to keep the pests off, and so sometimes you don't even have to think about it. You know that on this month or this date, you need this product to keep certain pests off. Well, in the ornamental, ornamental industry, it's the same way. Uh, it, they know that mites are going to show up in the spring. They know that aphids are going to show up right off the bat early, right after winter. They know that leaf miners probably in, toward the summer. So there's pesticides they put on a schedule and they'll start to spray. Even if the pest isn't there. And that's a kind of a fallacy or a problem because when you're growing things inside, you don't always have every pest that's available. And so one of the big deals and the big trends then is to try to reduce pesticide use. And one of the ways to reduce the pesticide use is to monitor for those pests. Actually look for them, find the ones that you are, uh, that are on the plants, identify them, and then use the proper pesticide in order to control them. So the trends are uh, to, to go away from that calendar schedule and start to use an effective use of integrated pest management, meaning every other thing before the pesticide. And the screening idea that is about to be used in the citrus nursery industry is something the ornamental industry went through a while back where the, the thrips are a very tiny insect, can get through a very small hole in a screen, it, we had to screen them out in order to even grow certain plants. Certain plants, would, if thrips got on it and transmitted certain diseases, you could lose the entire crop. Or you may be sending a plant that is diseased to a, another producer. And so screening the, the, the insects out is one of the first methods of IPM. Let's exclude them first. And then let's deal with them as they come in if they do get inside the facilities. So the trend is toward reduction in pesticide use, and these new trends can be attained through an effective monitoring and um, scouting schedule. So I'm going to talk about that, and then towards the end of the presentation, I'm going to talk about very briefly about the effective use of pesticides and a few things that some of uh, the growers that I've been associated with for a long time, the mistakes they've made to help you think about that beforehand. And some of the other presenters are going to talk about some of these things as well, like Beth Grafton Cardwell is going to talk about uh, best use of pesticides and how to rotate. And uh, we've got a couple other speakers who are going to touch on a couple of those things as well. So the first thing, the first basic part is of this program is to, is to have a knowledgeable staff, people that know the plant really, really well, know the pests really well. And I tell this to my growers, you guys are working with citrus. And so it's basically one plant. But the, the growers that I work with may have as many as 200 or 300 different kinds of plants in the same greenhouse. If they have one plant that is susceptible to one pest, they should know that. 
they should know that the petunia is going to be susceptible to this pest at this time, and then they'll know what to look for so that they're monitoring for it in order to control it. It's going to be the same thing in the citrus industry. You're going to, you know your pests. You should be start, start to monitor for them at specific times of the year. I'll also add this. Let me add it right now that I have a feeling that once you begin to start growing these indoors, that you're going to find there's going to be a few extra pests you haven't had to deal with outside before. That's most likely going to happen. Being very knowledgeable of the problems on those specific crops, the pest complexes of that crop, and then the seasonal trends, and the trends are very important. So recording the information is really going to be critical. You know, ACP, we don't want any at all, but you may very well end up with a few other things like mites. Mites cannot be, it's very hard to exclude mites with screening material, things like that. Thrips also. The screening that's going to go up to exclude ACP will not exclude thrips. Very knowledgeable of the thresholds, meaning what level of pest in that in that greenhouse, it reach it, what level will it reach before you need to treat? So those are very important things that you need to know. Very knowledgeable of the control measures. It doesn't make any sense to, to spray a thrips with a miticide. So you should know what the pest is and know what products are available. We kind of like to call it an IPM team. It should start with a scout, a person that regularly monitors the plants. A decision maker, a person who, all right, he gets that data and says, we need to treat, or no, it's not, we, we've got a few, you know, there's too few yet, there's not a problem here yet. You have a, then you have a grower, typically, a person who's already walking the crop, and he's, his responsibility is to grow the plants. All of these people will have contact with the plants, but the grower has a different aspect, a different perception of what's going on, versus a scout who's looking for specific things. Everybody together may see a problem and may find a, a reason for a control measure or not. So these people, whoever they may be, should meet regularly. And I know there are some facilities that, that I'm familiar with, it's one person. It's the owner who's spraying, who's growing, who's doing all of that. And it, so it can be like that, but this is kind of a team that you can have if you have a larger staff. There are several different kinds of sampling methods. There's an indirect sampling method, which I'm sure you're going to start to use. And then there's a direct sampling method. The in indirectly, you can collect things on sticky traps, which you've already seen. Osama showed you the yellow sticky cards. That's going to be a common uh, monitoring method. There are pheromone traps, black lights, indicator plants. You probably won't be doing anything like this, but you could if you think about it. Uh, plant or leaf samples. Now we're talking about direct sampling, so you're actually taking samples, bringing it back, looking at it under the microscope or whatever, if you have a microscope. There's other ways to look at it besides a microscope. So turning leaf and counting or observational counting of certain numbers of insects or mites. And then you, you probably won't need the potato disks, but one of the problems we do find in, when we use the soil that we use in ornamental production, we get fungus gnats. Wherever there's a lot of water and a lot of organic matter, there's a huge number of fungus gnats. Now, again, it may not be so much of a problem for the citrus nursery industry, but when fungus gnats reach a certain level, they'll eat the roots. And all of a sudden, your root hairs and things like that are gone, and the plants are go on to decline. So it may happen, I'm not sure. It depends on the soil type that you're basically using. So here's some, just some examples quickly of the indirect sampling methods. The yellow sticky cards, you'll see some fungus gnats on there most likely. There are some thrips, some white fly. Here's a thrips, there's some white fly in there as well. And other species of insects and other pests that you may run into. Uh, yellow is a very common color. A lot of the insects, aphids and other things are attracted to the yellow color. And it's because green in the plants has a lot of yellow in it, believe it or not. That's what they're actually seeing. There, the, for the cards that you put in the greenhouse, in the ornamental industry, it is recommended one per 10,000 square feet. Uh, when there's a real serious pest problem or a specific pest crop, pest that is on a certain crop, like poinsettia, uh, they grow them and they're starting to grow them right now for this season. It's densely grown. One per 10,000 square feet doesn't tell you enough. You want to really protect that plant from the white flies. So you put one per 1,000 square feet. It's a lot more expensive. And it's a, it's, but it's a lot better at catching a very serious problem in the greenhouse. You can also put them up at the vents to see if there's an influx. Hopefully, you're not going to have open vents because you, you need full exclusion of the ACP. 
So um, bringing it under the microscope is kind of important because you can identify the pests a lot better. And you should have somebody that's well trained that knows what those pests are can identify them well. If not, you have a record here where you can take that yellow card and wrap it in cellophane and send it to somebody who can identify and get a proper identification of that pest so you know what you're dealing with. This is a, is a method that's been used and I've used it a lot myself. It's a double sticky tape so you can buy this anywhere. It's just a cellophane tape that has sticky material on both sides and wrap it around either a citrus or, or a bougainvillea or whatever kind of plant it is, wrap it around and the little scales will get caught on that sticky tape. It, it is a warning, all right, now the crawlers are out, it's time to treat in order to deal with that population of scale insects. Pheromone traps can be used for the moths. We're having to do that a lot now lately. We've got new moth pests in the ornamental industry and you guys have one, of course. The, um, the citrus leaf miner. More direct sampling, literally, th this is direct sampling. The other was indirect where you're catching it on a trap or whatever. You don't know, not sure if it's on the plant or how many are on the plant. Direct sampling is you go right in and you use either an optivizer or a hand lens and you're looking directly at the leaf or at the pest, looking for the pest. This is a very excellent method and if you do it methodically through the greenhouse, you don't, it, it's time oriented. If, it, if you want to do your monitoring for an hour, well then you go through randomly through that greenhouse in an hour looking at certain levels of the plant to see if there's a pest. The other method is literally lift that plant up uh, looking at the undersides of the leaves. A lot of these pests really like the undersides of the leaves, like white flies and so on. And taking the, the samples right off and actually putting them under a microscope also is very helpful. Another reason why it's helpful is this, let's say you have a mite problem and you spray it and you go back out and you still see the mites on the leaf. Well, are they alive or not? That's really difficult to tell with a hand lens, but having a microscope or something that will magnify it would really tell you if your control measure is actually working. The tapping method, Osama showed that to you earlier. We use that a lot uh, to find thrips by tapping the, the leaf material onto a white sheet like that, so that's a good method. Also the beating method, he also talked about that, where you can um, beat trees and uh, we use this for the glass ring sharpshooter. We actually beat them down into a, a sweep net and collect them that way. So this will give you an idea if there's any pests that are on the trees, if they're a larger tree. And then looking at scouting the entire area. So you want to be consistent, uniform, like I mentioned, examining the undersides of leaves and so on. But what's really important are the flag, the hot spots. And because if you're, depending upon the size of the greenhouse facility that you have or the screening facility, you may not have to treat the entire thing. It makes not, not a lot of sense if everything is in the corner of the greenhouse or at a door. If, you, if a door is a constant problem, why not treat it at the door rather than the entire facility? So you can save a lot of time, effort, lab, labor, and so on by just treating in the hot spots. Okay, so. After you've got that information, you want to really keep good written records or good, in, good uh, records of your monitoring. It's really, really, really critical, especially for seasonal trends. Those trends are going to change when you've brought them from outside to inside. They will absolutely change. You will get more generations of your pest inside a greenhouse than you will outdoors. That's a huge difference from, what you're, from growing outside. The plants are going to be lusher and softer and there are going to be a lot more chances for a pest to really take off. So you need to know those trends and the new pests and so on that may end up on your crop. You want to measure that uh, damage, a measure of the damage or infestation so that a person can understand it and know whether they need to form a, a, a pest a control measure. You want to make sure that the pest species is properly identified and how many there are and where they are. And then the environmental conditions. And obviously, I've really harped on the, the, the seasonal trends, so you want to keep it every month or every week so that you know, week 37, we may have this problem again next year. I also, at the end of that slide, I was talking about costs. I'm not so sure that's important for you at this point, but I'll show you some research that we've done with the ornamental industry where we've actually saved them dollars by doing this. So I'll show you that to you in a little bit. So we tried this with a local grower, one of our growers, who, uh, just to give you an example, I want to throw this real quickly. One of our growers was, he, he had on his wall his annual schedule, week one through 52, and the pesticides he was going to treat with on every single week. 
whether he had that pest or not. And that's not a very, that's not the way to do it. <laughs> that's not a wise way to handle things. So what we did is I sent one of my scouts, my person, so she's the scout, I'm gonna be the decision maker, and then the grower who was working with the plants, he was also available, so the three of us met on a weekly basis and made the recommendation of what pesticides we needed to use to treat. The first thing that he hadn't done yet, he hadn't mapped his facility and organized his, his plants and so on, and then we did our weekly scouting and so on. So what we did was the first thing we did was we mapped his facility the color is right here. This represents a peak in a greenhouse. So they, sometimes they'll call it a house. And, but this is all one big greenhouse. This is a peak, and so there's six benches under that peak. This is the main aisle down the center. And then these are the plants that are on those benches. We have Syngonium and Diffenbachia and, and so on, all the way down the line, Neanthabella down here, etc. on the other side. And if there's a name in the middle, it means that there's some hanging plants in the middle between the aisles, between the benches. So we have some sagos hanging up above. And, and once we had it mapped, well now we can go through the greenhouse and tell him specifically on bench 35, we want you to treat those syngonium for mites. So that was the idea. You, you will probably need to do something similar in your facility in order to catch certain pests and certain uh, varieties of, of ornamentals or uh, <laughs> citrus. Okay, so here's the sheet then. Uh, our first monitoring, these are the, the where, where we looked at the bench number and then the plant that's on that bench and what were the pests. We found aphids later. Mites were a consistent problem. This is a foliage producer. Foliage producers always have mites. We looked for thrips, never really saw any, even on our yellow sticky cards, never saw any whitefly, never saw any scale. But we began to see some very significant fungus net numbers in both on the yellow sticky cards and on the benches, so we knew that, that the croton were gonna need the, uh, a treatment there. Another thing I wanted to mention, and you'll need to know this, there were mealybugs on some orchids. These were pet plants. Pet plants meaning, okay, you've got this beautiful greenhouse. You're gonna grow citrus, but hey, I'll bring the, the wife's plants over and throw them in the greenhouse. Well, that's what he did. He threw his wife's plants in the greenhouse. They were loaded with mealybugs and they were dropping down onto his coconut palms and infested all his coconut palms. So what I'm saying to you is probably not a good idea to put your pet plants in these greenhouses, okay? This was a constant problem that we had to deal with and it took a year for him to decide, okay, you know, the wife's orchids can go back home. Okay, so anyway, we took this then and I would make a recommendation. I told him exactly where his pest problems were so mites were on these benches on ivy, so 341, 57, 99. If you notice, there were 110 benches there. We're only spraying 341, 57, and 99, saving him an enormous amount of pesticide, an enormous amount of hose dragging with labor and so on. And, and uh, this is the way to do it rather than a continuous spray application. So I gave it then in summary, I wanted to spray these products on these plants, on these benches, and it was pretty simple. This is what needs to be done even in your facility. You get everybody together, here's the problem, it looks bad, we need to treat on these areas. So the benefits of monitoring then are an early warning system, locate specific sites of the pests, you identify the pest, the numbers and stages, you evaluate the control measures and you make recommendations, uh, collecting and graphing and monitoring the data for recording for future use. Reduction in levels of pesticide resistance, because you're not spraying as much. It, and I, it's clear, the more pesticide you use, the more resistance you're gonna get clear. Reduced exposure of workers, reduced pesticide runoff, which is really key in the ornamental industry. Runoff is huge, water cannot leave nurseries, period. Improved plant growth. We found that the quality of the plants that were not being sprayed as often were actually better. Uh, increased profits due to reduced pesticide spraying and so on. And here's the numbers. These are the plant types. There's Gerbera, field stock, field cut flowers, petunias, and roses. Uh, and you have a large acreage there. Standard practice, the spray gallons applied, 800 gallons, 300 gallons, 325, and then 300,000. This is just a large area. IPM monitoring, the, this was their standard practice. Here's after we got through with our monitoring. We reduced the amount of gallonage and the cost savings were approximately this uh, for each crop. And we also noted here that the reductions achieved uh, with our monitoring, no decrease in plant yield, 
and it, actually an increase in quality in some senses. So it makes sense to do the monitoring properly. First exclude, and then monitor and do a good job. So the most common causes of pesticide failure, I want to go through this quickly, because this is, okay, now you're spraying. So now what happens after the treatment applications? These are the most common things that we see uh, in the failure of control measures within ornamental plant production facilities. The one, the, many of them just do not do anything but the pesticides. By excluding all those other things, that makes a lot of pesticides fail in their application. Failure to monitor for the pests. Misidentification of pests, this is really common. There are so many pests on ornamental plants. There's so many things to look for. It's very common or easy to make a mistake. The wrong choice of the pesticide, that's also pretty common. This is the, one of the more common things that we see, that I've seen anyway, incorrect rates of pesticide or off-label use, and many times an old pesticide. And this grower that I just mentioned where we did all that monitoring with, he had a cabinet full of stuff that, well, they don't even have those things anymore. It's, that's how old those products were. They are probably 15 to 20 years old. There's no sense in keeping that stuff. It's not going to work anymore. The heat and other things just degrade these pesticides. The water quality is huge. You should all be looking at the water quality. A lot of the pesticides work better if it's, the water is acidic rather than basic, and you should know that and should be aware of that in, in your applications. Misuse or poor application or, or uh, calibration of equipment is another thing. Nozzles that have worn out, uh, things like that happen very commonly as well. Inadequate coverage. Now, coverage is probably the, one of the more common problems because plants are grown very tightly in these situations. So coverage is huge. So I'm going to talk about adjuvants here briefly in just a second. And then resistance or insecticide resistance, that's almost the last thing to look at. Because if you're doing all these other things ahead of time, you're probably not going to get resistance on some of these pests. The adjuvants will help you with that pH problem I talked about. So the pH can be managed by acidifiers. Drift can be managed or reduced by drift reduction agents. You can have stickers and spreaders, and, and there's products that the stickers will keep it in rain fast so it's not washed off. And that's important because a lot of the overhead irrigation goes on. Leaf cuticles can be disrupted with penetrants. That's for herbicides typically, but there are some penetrants that work real well for the systemics. You can improve the performance of an existing pesticide by using an adjuvant. You can enhance the consistency of existing products. So a lot of people that have used Avid or Abamectin against mites find that if they add an adjuvant, it actually works better or longer. Reduce the loss of product on the ground or elsewhere. So if it's a sticker, you're actually applying to the plant where it's being held there. And it, 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 I think in adjuvants, more and more, I see more and more people asking about it. So I think it's going to have an increased use in the future as well. So I'm going to go through these real fast. The insect life cycle is huge. So if you have a melon aphid, they're, uh, they're going to go through their life cycle very fast. A leaf miner, now this is the, uh, a dipterous leaf miner, a fly, rather than a moth, like you're probably used to with a citrus leaf miner. But the, I wanted to illustrate the difference in the life cycle and how it can have an effect on pesticide efficacy. Aphids are born pregnant. They bear alive young. They develop to adult in six days. And their generation time, basically from adult to adult, six days, it can be under at 85 degrees in a greenhouse. Eggs hatch for a leaf miner in about three days. Larvae develop in six. They earn the pupil in the soil, so they can't be contacted for 11 days. The adults then lives for 15. And their generation time, basically, is 30. So you can see when you rotate insecticides, you're going to need to rotate it more often to different chemical reactions or chemical uh, modes of action and Beth's going to talk about that later, for aphids than you will with leaf miners, because now you've got 30 days instead. That's really, really, really important, and you should be aware of the pests and their population cycle. So we harp on those things a lot. We, as educators, we try to say you should know the life cycle of the insect. Well, this is why. It's really important. Now, the incorrect rates. I wanted to give you one quick example. In a greenhouse, your insect pests will go through many more generations because it's warmer and it stays better throughout the year. And so pesticides will probably end up being used more often. And when that happens, a lot of the growers that I'm familiar with, 
we'll use the same pesticide over and over and over again to the point where we get resistance. But if it doesn't work at eight ounces anymore, well, 12's got to be better. And a, a lot of the research that's been done says 12 isn't always so much better. And so I wanted to quickly illustrate that for you. Look at how old your pesticide is, like I mentioned earlier. If the storage facility could be pretty hot. Where is that storage facility for your pesticides? So this is the leaf miner, that little fly I was talking about. This is a grower who was spraying the same product over and over, and I'll talk more about that in a sec. This, uh, it might be difficult to see, but this is a, a type of mum, and it's a cut flower, so it grows up, and they ro pull this wire up, and then finally, it, it, when it reaches the top, they cut it, and they sell it as a cut flower. But if you look closely, every single leaf, all the way up to the top of the plant, is mined with leaf miners. And it's because he's spraying every three days, he's spraying something. And so we decided to take a look at the resistance level of this insect. Well, here's some of the mines. You can see it's almost no green on the leaf left, all the way up to the top of the plant. It's kind of hard to sell a product like this. It's pretty tough. So we looked at the resistance level. We just did a normal bioassay. Our susceptible flies at UC Riverside would be killed at 1.5 parts per million to 100 parts per million. Very tiny amount of this insecticide would kill a normal leaf miner. This grower, I, it wouldn't, we couldn't kill that fly with 400 parts per million to 4,000 parts per million. In fact, at 4,000 parts per million, literally the, there's technical material wrapped around the, the vial that we put the bugs in. So they're walking on the technical pesticide and it still didn't kill them at all. And, and I thought, well, there must be something wrong. So I put some of the susceptible flies in those same vials. I literally took those flies out and put susceptible flies in. They were dead in 20 minutes, meaning that that pesticide's highly effective. But he has been using it so much that there's no way in the world it's going to work. So let me, let me see if I have that. He was using this product, which is spinosad, in every, and I emphasize, every treatment. And so if, he's, if he has mites, he's spraying, with, he's spraying with one of these products here, Avid, and he's putting conserve in. Okay, then he's spraying Dursban and conserve, Azotin and conserve, uh, Dipal and conserve, Orthene and conserve, Astro and conserve. It was conserve every three days with every pesticide that he was spraying. It's just, if you do that, you're going to end up with exactly the same problem. So I hope Beth, and I know she will, she's going to emphasize rotating these chemicals by chemical mode of action, and we'll, she'll talk about that. So the importance of rotating those pesticides is that resistance of individuals dominate the population if they're always used. Rotate by mode of action. The IRAC mode of action is what you really want to look for. A lot of the literature already, this stands for the um, Insecticide Resistance Action Committee. Sorry, it took me a sec to get that as I age. And then we, for ornamental industry, we have this chemical class chart that has a lot of those already listed on there and so on. There's got to be something that's available for you, and Beth has provided something for you in the handout. So the mode of action means what does it kill the insect by? And these are the things, organochlorines are gone, but it was the chlorine channel blocker. Pyrethroids are similar now that they depolarize the sodium channel on the, uh, the axon of a nerve. I know you all know what that is. But the neonicotinoids act like an acetylcholine mimic. So there, a lot of them are working on the nervous system. The soaps and oils will suffocate or desiccate the insect. And the IGRs, or the insect growth regulators, have either chitin synthesis inhibitors or juvenile hormones. So the, all of these products basically in here have a way, if you rotate among these, you're going to get a different mode of action attacking that insect at different times. So that's important to get the population. So in summary then, making the best use of pesticides, it's, it's, n n pesticides are not always necessary, so it should be used when it is necessary. The correct product for the correct pest at the correct stage is important, in making sure your pest is identified properly. Consider adjuvants in, in, in making, because your plants are going to be tight, even in this production that you're going to be doing, you want to get good coverage. Adjuvants can help you out with that. Follow the label. Please don't go over the label. It's the law anyway. But if you do, you realize you will end up in trouble. I can almost promise you. And rotate that mode of action. And it's okay to... The, the grower that I mentioned earlier that we did the monitoring for, 
I told him, you need to get, you need to buy this, this, and this, and this, and have it in the cabinet because I want to be able to rotate among them. He said, well, that's expensive. I said, it's a one-time thing, and as you rotate, you're going to save a fortune because you're not going to have to spray as much. You're going to knock that population down to the point where you're not going to see it as much anymore. Okay, so I'm going to stop there. I'll take some questions, and here's my information. If you don't have it, if you want to try to contact me, uh, feel free. In my email is right there, and feel free to email me if you would like. Um, you are part of the industry that I am associated with, and uh, you together with everybody else are powerful. You should realize that, okay? I'll take questions. Any questions? Bob. Okay, Bob asked, are there any kind of sunburn protection for the plants? Because how I mentioned that you take plants from outside, to, or inside, sorry, to the outdoor environment. And I, they, uh, it is very common. A lot of the growers that I have worked with, they actually allow the plants to be sunburned and then they recover. But uh, that, I don't think that's such a good idea. They should go through a, a, uh, a transition. And the transition meaning they should go under screen or shade cloth, in the, which is outdoors, in the sun, in a natural environment for a while before they go in the direct sun. That's the best way to do it. I, I believe there are a few products that are available out there where you can spray to protect the leaves and so on, but I, I have not had any, not familiar with any research or anything about that. Uh, there are also some, it's kind of expensive, but you can add some lighting to, to kind of reproduce what's going on outside, but I, I don't know that I'd recommend that either. I think the transition is much better. The, the, uh, the industry, uh, the, the more threatened plants in the ornamental plant industry have got to be under some protection. And the people that are selling propagated material, so they're going to take that product and give it to a finisher. In other words, the other people in the industry that are going to grow it in a pot and grow it on, they can't afford to have some of these pests or diseases on them at all. And so what they'll do is they take the cuttings or the, the, the most uh, sensitive plants and they put them in a very secure facility. And so certain growers have very secure facilities, meaning that you, when you walk into an ante room, a small room before you go into the greenhouse, the doors do not go directly in front of each other. You walk into that room, you put a suit on to cover your clothes, you put a, you, sometimes a, something over your head, and I didn't need one because I don't have any hair. So, but, but anyway, a little cap or booties, and you walk into the facility. It's highly controlled. The people that are in there only work in that facility, and then they work with those plants, and then the, when the plants come out, they're in the normal environment, or they go to a greenhouse and they're, they're worked with. So some go through that kind of security. Others, less security than that, but, but there are many, many that have that. So... The vast majority of the ornamental plants don't need quite that much security because there's, I mean, there's 20, 30,000 different kinds, and so there's only a few that really need to deal with it like that. So the growers that work with those sensitive plant types have those facilities, uh, and there's many of them in San Diego County that I've worked with here, and I've seen them in other places, in Gilroy, Watsonville, and so on as well. So the, the evolution is now they know what to do, with the highly sensitive plants. So any grower that grows those plants has got to be under that kind of protection. It, it, she, did, she more or less reiterated what I said, but, uh, but she's very familiar with the stock plants and the Western flower thrips or thrips are the major pests, can transmit tospel viruses that can really wipe out crops completely. Uh, and I have seen many structures with the pad and fan and the fan or the pad area is completely covered with screening a box behind the screening area and so on. So I think we've talked a lot about that at other. How do you protect your facility for in intrusions of mites? And it, they, because the mites under high populations can actually do significant damage, cause necrosis on leaves or silvering or bronzing or whatever of the leaves, very significant damage. And that is not gonna, you do not, you cannot exclude the mite. The mite is gonna get in either as an egg on the plants or through the, the plant material, through the the soil anyway, the mites are going to get in there. You are going to have to monitor for it and you're going to have to treat for it. And you can, there are a lot of softer products that will work on mites. The soaps and oils work real well, the, the um, ultrafine oil and things like that. But, but you're going to probably have to treat for mites, in my opinion. I, 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 I've not heard about that before. Bob was saying that uh, USDA or somebody says screen for mites. 
you, you, that's virtually impossible, in my opinion. 